Praise the Lord. Well, first thing I need to mention, I don't know if you've noticed, but Andrew called me early this morning and asked me what I was wearing. <laughs> and uh, I said, Andrew, you got to stop calling me every morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I know the first thing I walked in this morning and Andrew's got on the same thing I got on. So I thought, well, what are the odds? Usually he has on a vest and different outfit than mine, but uh, <laughs> praise God. How's everybody doing? I'll tell you what, God is so good, and uh, what, a, what a privilege it is for us to be here, and what a blessing this place is. Can you, I mean, look at this. This is incredible, and uh, here we are sitting in a man's vision. Praise God, and uh, all things are possible. Amen. So I have been here since uh, 2007 is when I first came up to this ministry. Before that, I was in the Dallas area. I had a Spanish Bible school there for a number of years. Before that, we were missionaries in uh, Chile for 12 years. Uh, So anyway, we've been here since 2007, and I've been teaching, uh, that's almost 17 years this summer is my anniversary. And then uh, we've been teaching, I've been teaching 15 years in the school. Uh, Right now, I'm teaching 16 courses, 16 and a half courses. Uh, I'm sure one with Greg, and uh, he needed some help. So uh, (laughs) anyway, just a pleasure. I teach in uh, first year, second year, and third year. Uh, I have a number of courses in all of those, and uh, just I'm having the time of my life. So uh, happy to get to share the word with you all today, and uh, hope that you get blessed. I I have a feeling that some of the things I'm going to say are have been said, and that used to bother me. Uh, it doesn't anymore because I realize I, I eat steak more than once. <laughs> I didn't eat steak in 1972 and stop eating steak. Uh, I eat steak all the time. I eat fried chicken all the time. I eat all kinds of good food all the time. And sometimes you need to hear something from the word more than once, right? I need to hear it all the time. I keep myself stirred up in the word. And so that's what I want to do with you today is is get us stirred up in the word. And I want to talk to you about how you see things, how you see things. So I want to go with you to uh, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I'm reading from New King James. I'm going to start in verse 35. And it says, on the same day when the evening had come, he said to them, his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. So he's in a bigger craft, apparently. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep, on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, but he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? And so from this story, now I teach this story in different kinds of messages, but I have a particular goal today, and that is for us to understand three major forces that shape your life. And you may not even be aware of it, but you will be here momentarily. There are three major forces or powers or perceptions that that shape all of our lives. And as we read through this story, I see that the first thing that happens is that there's a storm. I mean, Jesus has already said, we're going to the other side. He could have said, with a boat or without a boat, it doesn't matter. We're, We're going to the other side. And then a storm arises and Jesus is asleep. And the disciples obviously are starting to freak out. They're, they're familiar with the sea and they're familiar with storms and they're not, it's not looking good. And they, came, they come to Jesus and they say, don't you care? Let's just stop right there. I'll take this first part. Don't you care? And this is a, a major perception, is something that is in, in us that needs, perhaps needs to be changed, renewed, what do you, how do you see God? And the disciples immediately see God as not caring. I mean, they're seeing Jesus as not caring. And I find this in, in a lot of religion. 
is that we have had 2,000 years, and in this country, what, 300 years of a lot of traditional religious teaching that has painted a picture of God that is not accurate. And basically, the picture of God that we've gotten in many, many churches is that God doesn't care, or he only cares sometimes, only, only, he only cares for some people, and he'll only move in certain cases, and you just have to put up with whatever will be, will be. And I find that even in Christians that are somewhat familiar with the message that we share here, uh, the faith and grace message, uh, even some Christians write me, I get lots of, lots of communication from people out, out in the world and out in other kinds of religious backgrounds, and they write, why won't God do anything for me? Doesn't God care? Look at my life. Look at the mess that it is. And, and they'll even admit they're, they're the problem, but still they expect God to sovereignly intervene and fix everything. And a lot of people come to God in that way. Doesn't God care? Don't you know that I'm sick? Don't you know that my marriage is falling apart? Don't you know that, that uh, my kids are off in, in problems? And don't you know I lost my job? And God, don't you know? And don't you care? <laughs> Is anybody relating to some of this? That so many people have an image of God, have a perception of God or a force in their life that is shaping their life and that's their perception or their vision or how they see God. And if they have God up here far, far away and uncaring, sitting on his hands, not doing anything, not, uh, not, care, not involved in our lives, or they'll have cliches. I did a message a number of years ago on the gospel of cliches. And uh, I, think there's, I think I had five in that message, but one of them is, well, God is in control. And that's a favorite one that many people go to. God is in control. Everything happens for a reason. Okay, if you've heard these, well, I, I know you have. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, right? God moves in mysterious ways, <laughs> right? And so we have all of these cliches, all of these are the result of having a wrong view of God that God is distant and does not really care. Or if he was really love, why doesn't he do something? And so we're putting all of the, all of the responsibility on God because religion has told us he's really responsible. He's sovereign. He's in control. Everything happens for a reason. And so, well, I guess I'm just not one of those lucky ones. And we have these perceptions of God that are... Forgive me, but they're antichrist. They're, they're not right. They're not right to the point of stealing our inheritance and stealing our potential and stealing and, and, and maligning the, the love of God, maligning the image of God that we should have. And so now we have a corrupted image of God. That is going to shape your life. It'll shape what you do in life. You won't, it'll shape your destiny, your career, your job, your ministry, whatever it is you're doing. If you have a wrong view of God, what you do is never going to come out right. We've got to understand the true nature of God. Andrew has a book called that. I would recommend that. The true nature of God. Does God care or not? Well, the disciples didn't think he cared. They're in the middle of a crisis in their perception. We'll talk about that later. They're in the middle of a crisis, and their first reaction is, don't you care? They go on to say that we are perishing. We'll look at that in a minute. Don't you care? And I'm thinking, how could anybody say that about God? When he's the one that sent his son to die for us. Amen? Amen. That he gave his life for us, for God so loved the world. We'll get the world the word world out of the equation, for God so loved you. See, we tend to make it this fuzzy mass thing. No, he loved you. He so loved you that he sent his only begotten son that you wouldn't perish. He does care. That's why he came. But see, we have to get our minds renewed. You know, it says in Romans 12 too, that we be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. But that, that mind renewal, that's what we do here. I think what I'm trying to do in this message is give you kind of a composite of, of what a lot of us are trying to impart in Keras. And the, the first thing that we want to change is how you see God. If you don't see God the right way, the rest of your life is going to be a mess. 
when we say, don't you care, or why doesn't God do something, or we just, just we give up and say, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. That is destructive theology. And, and yet that's taught from many pulpits in this nation and around the world. In fact, I was in Latin America for many years, and the favorite verse down there was, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. They know that more than they know John 3.16. Is anybody in here? I thought, I thought my microphone went off. Okay. So <laughs> in, uh, in Proverbs 4.23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. In your heart are your perceptions. In your heart is how you see God. Keep your heart with all diligence because from your heart is going to come your vision of how you see God. And if your God is one that doesn't care, hands off, not gonna get involved, don't really care about you, everything's predestined, everything happens for a reason, if that's your vision of God, then you're gonna be in a world of hurt for your whole life until you can come to know the true God, truly know God and who he truly is. John 10.10, 10. John 10.10 10 says the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. Well, that should be the plumb line of all Bible interpretation right there. Amen. Amen. There is someone called the thief, and his, his vision for you is to give you a bad vision of God. And to steal your vision of God, to steal your comprehension of God, to sow something else into you that God doesn't care He's distant, he's far away, he, he doesn't get involved. And we come away, we, I don't even know why people go to church with that's their vision of God, why even go? What's the point if God doesn't care? But Jesus says, I have come that they might have life, and that they might have it abundantly. Amen. So now we, I have another message, I'm not gonna do it today, but called the extravagance of God. And there are, there are so many verses that talk about how good God is. How extravagant. I might start preaching it anyway. <laughs> he, he is a pressed down, shaken together, running over God. Yay! Amen. Yay! When it says abundant life, it's not talking about just barely getting by life. Right. I have come that they might have life, they might have it more abundantly. Well, it's in my heart in this Bible school is to do what I can do to impart into the students how good God is because that has been stolen from us by so much tradition, so much religion, so many concepts of God that aren't God, they're, they're anti-God so many times. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. I mean, it couldn't get more clear. There are so many verses that describe this, but if there wasn't a good God, there would be no goodness in this world, therefore we wouldn't even be here. There would, it, nothing would exist. God is so good, it says he makes his rain fall on the just and the, the, and the unjust. Everything good that happens in this world has a source. And that source is God. If there were no God, there would be no goodness. Every good thing happens. Every good gift comes from God. And so our perception of God is going to have everything to do with how we respond in this life to what we think God is like. Now, people that say, well, I don't even believe there is a God. Okay, that's a perception that is going to shape their life. I'm not sure if there's a God. That's a perception that's going to shape your life. Well, I think there's a God, but I don't think he cares about me. That's going to shape your life. How you see him, is he distant? Is he angry? What, what is his attitude towards you? Well, I just don't know. Well, that's good. your unknowing is going to shape your life. And so we need to understand, if, he, if Jesus says, I've come that they might have life and that might have it more abundantly, and then it says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father, so now he's a father. He's not a distant dictator. Amen. The clues are all here in the word of God of how God is. But it seems to be difficult, especially with Christians, for some reason, for them to, to open their hearts and believe that God is for them. Do you know no one in this universe loves you more than God? Amen. God is the greatest lover there is. 
He loves you so much, he died for you. And th this, this, this perception that we have is going to determine if you get healed. It's going to determine if you have a happy marriage. It's going to determine if you have healthy children. It's going to determine everything in your life. Is he for you or is he against you? And, and, Chris, and I, again, I have a, a ministry on Facebook and I get all kinds of letters from people that have these kinds of questions about the nature of God. And it, it can get tiring to answer the same kinds of things, but I realize the, the vast amount of Christians, or at least they, they believe they're Christians, they call themselves Christians, but their concept of God is entirely anti-biblical. It's not what Jesus revealed. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Well, did Jesus go around hurting people? No. What's it say in Acts 10.38? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the... Okay, now we've got, now we've got something to, to work with here. We've got a devil. Well, didn't Jesus just say the thief comes not except for to steal, kill, and destroy? So now this stealing, killing, and destruction has a, has a source. And it's not God. Every good gift comes from God. I know this sounds basic to a lot of you, but you would be shocked at how many people don't have this figured out, that God is for them, and there is no one else on this planet that's more for them than God. And there is no one else in the universe that loves them more than God does. And no one that desires our, our benefit, our blessing, more than God does. It says in uh, Hebrews, and I think it's 6, I'm going to say 14, I'm not sure. That he said to Abraham, and we are children of Abraham by faith. Do I have it right? Yeah, thank you. That surely blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. What, what God was saying here to Abraham, but, but the, the, the heart of this is for us as well. It didn't stop with Abraham. Because we are the seed of Abraham. We are the children of God. God lives in us. And he could have just said, I will bless you. And that would, you can take that to the bank. But he, that's not strong enough. He said, no. Blessing, I will bless you. And I'm thinking, okay, I, I, I'm not sure I can even figure that out. While he's blessing me, he's blessing me. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And then he, I can see God shaking his head, no, that's not strong enough. I'm going to put an oath on it. God doesn't lie. He doesn't need to say anything else. He, all he had to say was, I will bless you. But he says, surely, surely, he didn't have to say that, surely, while I'm blessing you, I'm going to be blessing you. Woo! And while I'm multiplying you, I'm going Yay! to multiply you. Every good gift, abundant life, pressed down, shaken together, running over, the grace of God, the love of God. It, once you get your head wrapped around this and get, get a revelation of how much God loves you, that will change your, your life. That will change your destiny. Amen. Your perception of God is shaping, it has shaped you to this point. Amen. Whether you even believe there is a God or not, that has shaped you. Or if you think he's angry with you or you're guilty and you're unworthy, well, yeah, duh, we're all unworthy, right? But he made us worthy. He gave us his righteousness. Romans 5, 17 says that he has given us the gift of righteousness. And so it's not about us being worthy or unworthy. It's about how much has he loved you that he gave you his own nature, his own sinless perfection in your spirit. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. These perceptions will change your life. But if we keep going along moaning and groaning about, well, I'm just not, not sure God loves me and, and I think uh, he's made me sick to teach me something. No, sickness is not a teacher. The Holy Spirit and the Word are teachers. Amen. If sickness and tragedy are your teachers, you're in the wrong kingdom. You need to change. Come over into the light. Get, get, get a right perception of God. Exodus, in Exodus 34, 6, Moses said to God on the mountain, he says, let me see your glory. And I like the way God responds to him. He says, I'll show you my goodness. Not too many people think of his glory as his goodness, but I do. 
He says, let me show you my goodness. In Exodus 34, 6, it says, And the Lord passed before him, before Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Now, this is when he's given them the law, for crying out loud. And yet, that was a, a system by which he was going to bring forth Jesus, but that didn't change God's nature. That God is good, abounding in mercy and loving kindness. I went through a, uh, many of you might, might know this already, but I went through a battle with cancer back in 2020. And I was very near death. I was two days from death. I didn't even know it. And uh, I had enough of a revelation of the goodness of God to be able to hear God speak to me and tell me after they just told me to get my affairs in order, literally within seconds, the Spirit of God spoke to me, you will not die from this. Amen. Now, that was a still small voice. It, I mean, I was still contemplating what the doctor had just said, but I had that sensation in my spirit. I will not die from this. Well, I came close, but I didn't die from that. But that, took, that started a journey for me. Now, I've had a, a good understanding of God's goodness, I thought. But as I came through that battle, that was a year-long battle. When I came through that battle, I decided I'm going to study the goodness of God. And I've gone through my Bible and I've looked up everything I can about God's goodness, his favor, his blessings, his love, his compassion, every, any, everything positive. I, I just made a decision. I'm just going to eat from the tree of life for a while. Okay, I, the, the knowledge of good and evil I'm done with. I want the tree of life. And I looked up every good thing I could find about God. And I will tell you, the more revelation I got about God's goodness, the more faith exploded in my heart. Instead of studying faith, I started studying God's goodness, and my faith got a jolt. My perception of God has, in the last, I tell people, the last three years have been the best three years of my life. Hallelujah. First of all, I'm alive. That's good. Okay. But it has been such a blessing, and people see Barry, I, I, they see me, they, they, or they hear me teach on a live Bible study or in school you seem different. I am different. Because my perception of God, as good as it had been, has gotten so much better. It has gotten so much more powerful. So God, surely blessing, he is blessing me. Surely, surely, surely blessing, blessing, blessing. He is blessing me and multiplying. He is multiplying me. I have take, see, I've taken that for myself. I make these things personal. And my life is a pressed down, shaken together, running over life. But see, those are, that's a perception, that's a force a, that is shaping my future. And I'm going to have a long one and it's going to be cool. Amen. Why? Because I see God for who he is. I see how much he loves me. I see that he died for me. I'm seeing things spiritually that I used to know mentally. And I, I won't say they weren't revelations, but they have just become bigger, deeper revelations Amen. of the goodness of God. How you see God is shaping your life. And the God you have and how distant he is, well, mine is real close. He's in here. Is yours? And you don't seem very convinced. Okay. He lives in you. The God of the universe that created all things and loves you and sent Jesus to die for you now lives in you. And he's saying right now, surely blessing I am blessing you and multiplying I am multiplying you. And some of you are saying, well, I don't see it. That's your attitude. That's your perception that is blocking it. That's the problem. Is that you haven't been fully convinced yet that God is on your side. No one loves you more than God. No one is more for you than God is. Amen. All right. Psalm 27, 13. Psalm 27, 13 says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We live in a society right now where people are losing heart daily, minute by minute. People are giving up. People are killing themselves because they have lost heart because they have a wrong perception of God. 
David, before Jesus, is saying, I would have lost heart, except I believed I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. When you're told you're dying, where are you going to go? When you're told if you hadn't come in on Friday, you would be dead by Monday, as it is, get your affairs in order, we'll save your life for a temporary amount of time. This is stuff that happened to me. Where are you going to go? What are you going to believe? Who is your God? What is your perception of him? I guess God wants me to die. Or I guess he's trying to teach me something. Or I guess I sinned and I'm unworthy. Or I guess this or I guess that. See, your perception could kill you. Or it could make you alive. It could heal you. I would have lost heart, except I believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Where's your heart? Watch over your heart, for out of your heart flow the issues of life. Out of your heart flow your perceptions of God. From your heart you have fellowship with him or you don't. You may have religion with him, but I would suggest fellowship with him is is a lot better. And I tell the students this quite a bit. For me, walking and talking with God is my new religion. Uh, I, I just, it, and it's, well, how often do you pray? And how long do you pray, Barry? And I don't know, all day. <laughs> I, say, I say, it's like a marriage. Walking with God is like being married. Every day is different. I have different amounts of time with my wife every day. I don't get into guilt and condemnation over it. I, well, I don't watch the clock. Did I talk to her long enough? It's a relationship. It's a fellowship. Walking and talking with God is just like breathing. I have gotten all the religion out of it. And it has become so sweet to just know God is for me. God is blessing me. God loves me. God lives in me. That's my perception. That's my vision. That is shaping my life and it's taking it in, in good places. Praise God. All right. So... So that's one perception. I'm going to give you three here. The second perception, they come up to Jesus, they shake him, they wake him up and say, Master, don't you care? And then they say that we are perishing. Let's look at that one, that we are perishing. First of all, they have an idea of Jesus not caring. So I think we've we've covered that. And then their second concept is that they are perishing or they have a victim mentality based upon the perception that God doesn't really care. Well, if you have the wrong perception of God, you're gonna, find, you're gonna feel like a victim because you don't know if you've messed up, if he's out to get you, if, if, if this is punishment, if this is, you know, well, I guess I deserve this. Well, yeah, we, all, we all deserve death. Get over it. We've been, great, we've been gifted life and righteousness. So it's not about what you deserve, it's what Jesus gave you because he loves you. But don't you care that we are perishing? How do you see yourself? First of all, how do you see God? Then how do you see yourself? How does that go, Proverbs 23, 7? As a man thinks, as as he thinks in his heart, so is he. How you think in your heart about God, okay, I'm gonna try to not keep mentioning that, but that's the beginning of all of this. But how you think in your heart about God is going to reflect in how you think about yourself. And if you only see yourself as guilty, if you only see yourself as unworthy, if you only see yourself as uh, just second class, I mean, some of us were raised that way. We were raised to think less of ourselves. Uh, Andrew was saying he was an introvert. I've, I'm, I'm an introvert. I don't see that as a necessarily a bad thing. The shyness and timidity and the fear, that's the bad thing. The positive side of an introvert is that you, I just need quiet time to recharge. I just have, I need a lot of time with God. I'm not, but I'm not shy and timid. This is a miracle. Me standing up here is a miracle. I mean, I have had traumatic experiences in junior high and so forth. Uh, So public speaking to me is is what I love. it's, It's just everything. I get to share the love of God with people. But that's a perception that had to be changed a perception of who I am, a vision of who I am. 
who he is inside of me, better said. What, what can God do through me? What is the grace of God that's available? Surely blessing, he is blessing me. Surely gracing, he is gracing me. We can say it that way. Amen? Amen. For what? How do you see yourself? And a lot of people just see themselves as victims. Their whole life is victimhood. Their whole life is complaining. And then they keep going back to, why doesn't God do anything? And this is a real problem, and it's a real problem in the church, and it's a real problem amongst Christians. Ephesians 1.6 says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Is that, is that for you? Absolutely, that's for you. Is anybody listening to me? Okay. That's, I need participation here. All right. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. That word accepted means highly favored, honored with blessings. That's how much, okay. Don't go overboard. I just, I just need to hear somebody breathing now and then, all right? Okay. You are highly favored. You. See, we, we always project that onto somebody else or to the masses. No, you are highly favored. You are accepted in the beloved. You have been loved with an everlasting love. God has chosen to live in you. You've become his temple. How do you see yourself? Because how you see God is, is the, the baseline of this. But from that is going to be how you see yourself. And if you see yourself as unworthy, incapable, inferior, we, we've been hearing some tremendous testimonies. Uh, I mean, I, this is when I really get to know some of these students is when I hear these testimonies. I think, my goodness, what a powerful, life-changing thing that is happening in this school for so many people. Yeah. Praise God. And they're get, what they're getting renewed is their, their image of God and their image, therefore, of themselves. And what is possible? And you had people that feared doing plays that are now doing plays, and you have people that feared all kinds of things, and they're now doing it because they're being transformed, because they're getting a different vision. That's right. A vision of the grace of God, of what's possible, the love of God, how much God loves them, and it breaks them from their shyness and timidity and fear or their ego or whatever they've been dealing with, and it allows you to walk into the, the blessings of God for your life. Every good thing comes from God. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. You know, God is drawing through the gospel, the this, this gospel of love and grace, God is trying to draw everybody on this earth. This message, but it has to be preached through us. But God's heart, if God's heart is in you, how can you share the love of God if you don't believe God loves you? How can you be an effective witness if you think God is distant and angry and that you're just a worthless sinner? How can that impact the world? How can God use you to draw people to him if you don't even know him? Yeah. Amen. I have Woo. loved you with an ever- Lasting, how long is that? Ever. Ever. I think in the Hebrew that means everlasting. <laughs> I have drawn you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness, I am drawing you. I have loved you with this everlasting love. I, I, what I do is I sit with the Lord and I'll close my eyes and I'll see these things. I've become very good at this. I choose to see what I'm reading. I choose to let the image or the vision of it, and if it's a gospel account of something, I'll make a movie out of it. I don't watch movies on TV that, about the, the Bible. Mine are much better. Because right? I don't screw up. They screw up. Okay? But I see these things. There's one verse that talks about his paths drip with abundance. Okay, I'm still struggling with that one. What does that look like? The paths of God and they drip 
with abundance. We have an extravagant God. He's accepted you in the beloved. You're highly favored. That's going to shape your life. These perceptions I'm talking about, these images or visions that you have of God and of yourself are shaping your life. And wherever you are right now, it can be better. Mine will be better. Next week, it's going to be even better. Amen. Because I've taken the limits off of this and I realize that God is, is bigger, as Greg would say, more gooder than I've ever dreamed. He is so for me. He rejoices over me with joy. I keep saying me, but this is for you. But don't say, well, that's Barry. No, take it. Take it. It's you too. It's your perception. And you, why doesn't anything go my way? That's the victim mentality. Don't you care that we are perishing? That's the victim mentality. Why doesn't God do anything? That's the wrong mentality. That's the wrong perception. That's the wrong vision. It's a force that you've allowed in your life, a negative force of God doesn't care and I'm a victim. Yeah. Those are negative forces that are going to determine your destiny. This is important stuff. It's a very simple message, but this is, these are powerful things that can change your life. Your perceptions have shaped you up to this point. Amen. Amen. How's it going? You might want some new perceptions of how much God loves you, how much God is for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Well, what are those? (sighs) See, religious people will say, yeah, he's pretty upset with me. No, get rid of that. All of of your mess ups, he he nailed to the cross because he loves you so much. It's already dealt with. It says in Isaiah 53, he looked at the travail of Jesus and was satisfied. He's satisfied. He doesn't have to make you suffer. He's not in the suffering business. Amen. People will make you suffer because you have so much joy and love and peace. They'll say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> All right. Was, it, was that your message this morning, Greg, about persecution and, and suffering? When people see happy Christians, they just can't stand it. But we haven't given them a whole lot to be persecuted for in, in traditional churches. But man, let's, change, let's turn the story around here. We should, we're the head and not the tail. We should be the happiest people on earth. We should, be the, we should be the most blessed, the most highly favored. We should be the most prosperous. Yes, I said it. Amen. Why? Because we're God's kids. God lives in us. But see, the religious people, their heads are already exploding. No, Barry, stop. Whoa. I'm telling you, this is the gospel, but you may not have heard it before, but if you get into our classes here at Karis, this is what you're going to hear, because you need a different perception. You need a different image of God, a different image of who you are. I didn't even finish the verse. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Well, religion teaches you that God's the author of evil. Well, then why did Jesus come to destroy the works of the devil if the works of the devil are his works? No, I mean, the nonsense that is taught from pulpits, I just, I can't get over. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come to destroy the works of the devil, Jesus says. Amen. Amen. We we need to figure out which side is which here. That's a perception. That's an image, a vision that's going to control your life. I'm going to finish this verse. (laughs) thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hard time (laughs) to give you a future and a hope God is for you and when people say well why doesn't God do anything God don't you care let me let me do this with you he's given what has he done for you he's given you his name that is above every name He's given you his blood that has washed you and cleansed you. He's given you his spirit to live in you. He's given you his word, the living word, sharper than any two-edged sword. He's given you his promises by which we can partake of his divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world. He's given you his authority. 
It's not even delegated like with the disciples. It's inherent. It's in us. His authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Amen. He's given you his faith. The fruit of the spirit is his faith. You don't even have to work up your own faith. He gave you his faith. What else? He's given you the keys of the kingdom or the principles to know how the kingdom works. He's given you his wisdom. He's given you his peace. He's given you his, he's shed his love abroad in your heart. You don't even have to work up your own love. You've got his. He's given you his joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And when people write me and say, why doesn't God do anything for me? And I'm thinking, are you out of your mind? What else can he do for you? Now, I know they're, they're hurting. They, they have wrong perceptions. I don't, I'm not that cruel. I don't say that. I, I think it. <laughs> but, but it's because they have, religion has stolen so much yes. from the body of Christ to where yes. we see ourselves as yes. victims because God is distant and doesn't care. Yeah. And therefore, we're just going to have to hang on, do the best we can. And yet he has overladen us. Is that a word? It is now. With all of his benefits, Yay. with the inheritance, Woo. the name, the spirit, either one of those is enough. The love, the promises, the word, the covenant. We have a better covenant established on better promises. The authority. Yes. Amen. Young lady, I think she was a first year young lady. Maybe she's here. I don't know. But came up to me a couple of days ago and, and wanted to have an explanation of what it means that the, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Anything that comes against your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, good. sickness is violence against the kingdom. Poverty is violence against the kingdom. Depression is violence against the kingdom. Anxiety, fear, all of these kinds of things that are part of the, the darkness of corruption, that's violence against the kingdom. And the violent have got to stand up and take their, their inheritance by force. But if you have a wrong perception of God and a wrong perception of yourself and God is distant and you're unworthy, you're not going to do anything. When you have everything you need to reign in life. Everyone in this room that's born again, and if you're not, you need to get born again. You are fully equipped with all the latest stuff. You know how cars every year, they have more stuff? Well, you, when you got Jesus, you got the latest, and there's no more latest. It's, it's that you got the whole thing. You've got the name above every name. You've got the power. You have the authority. All you need is the vision to believe this stuff, that God is good, and God is for you, and God lives in you, and you're not a victim. The devil should be the victim. You need to take by force what you're, what's yours. If you find out you have an inheritance, somebody dies and leaves you $50 million, probably you're going to do what you need to do to get a hold of that, right? You might even hire a lawyer, whatever you need to do to get that inheritance. You're going to fight for that inheritance. You've got something way better than $50 million. We've got the God of the universe living inside of you. And usually we just leave him sitting there twiddling his thumbs, waiting because we think we're victims and he's, he lives somewhere else. And so we're not taking our inheritance we're not conquering, we're not reigning, we're not declaring, we're not, we're not approaching this with the right force because we have the wrong perceptions of who he is and the wrong perception of who we are and why doesn't God do anything? And we're really good at complaining, but we're not that great about declaring because we're not convinced. You gotta get fully persuaded like Abraham was, amen? This is a room full of fully persuaded people, amen? <laughs> Praise God. So let's look at the third perception here. The third, they come to Jesus and say, don't you care that we are per perishing? So they have a wrong view of God. Don't you care? We're victims. We are perishing. And he rebukes them. He stands up first from a place of sleeping in a storm, peace, and rebukes the wind and the waves and the wind and the waves stop. And then he says, why are you fearful? How is it you have no faith? 
He expected them to take care of this. He's already given them all authority over all the works of the enemy. They were supposed to do this and let him have a nap. <laughs> the third perception, and I've already kind of crossed into this, but it's your perception of the circumstances. Too many people have become slaves of circumstances. They fear circumstances. They don't know what to do in the face of circumstances. If something doesn't go just right, doesn't God care? Why won't he do anything? I'm just a poor sinner, barely saved by grace. And they get into their religious mindset, start rattling off the cliches. Circumstances are meant to be overcome. And we have been equipped to overcome. Again, what do we have? We have his name, we have his spirit, we have his blood, we have his word, we have his promises, we have his covenant, we have his, his faith, we have his authority. We have the gifts of the spirit, we have the fruit of the spirit. I mean, what more do you need? And so when we have circumstances come against us, and they will, but it says in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 4, that he's given us his promises that by these we can escape the corruption, all the stuff, the circumstances. By the promises of God. Do you even know the promises of God? Well, that was for Abraham. That was for somebody else. That was, and most of them are for Andrew. And <laughs> no, Andrew would be the first to tell you, he's just a normal guy that decided to believe God. Yes. And anything good that's happened in my life, I'm, I'm as, as normal as dirt, but I've chosen to believe God. I've cho I haven't done it perfectly. I've messed up some, some things, but I'm still here. And I'm still believing God. Amen. And I'm still seeing the goodness of God. And surely he is still blessing me and multiplying, multiplying me. And it, it, life is getting better and better and better. <laughs> but why? It's these three things I'm talking about. How do you see God? Is he for you? Does he love you? Is he in you? Yes. How do you see yourself? Well, we're just under the table hoping for some crumbs. No, I'm at the table. Come on up. I'm at the table enjoying a feast of the blessings of God. Well, how'd you get there, Barry? I had to change how I see God and how I see me. And once I got that figured out, I'm at the table. And the circumstances are there to be overcome. I mean, we, we live in a fallen world. Things are going to come against you. Stuff happens. I've had challenges. I'm having challenges right now in different areas of my life. I don't get bothered anymore because I know the source of the victory. I know him. Not just I know about him. I know him. I know in whom I have believed. And I'm knowing him better every day. 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4 says, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith. So don't, take that on, don't make that a subject. Faith comes by hearing. hearing. Where does hearing come from? How does that happen? Walking and talking with God. Don't make it religious. Just have fellowship with him. Faith cometh by fellowship. That's how I say it now. Because in fellowship, I hear. In fellowship, I see. In fellowship, I, I get quickened. Verses come alive to me. I, I make movies. I, I told you, I, I see things. And what is that doing? That's my fellowship, and it's quickening these things in me so that I don't get afraid of circumstances. You shouldn't be afraid of circumstances. They're just opportunities to show the glory of God. But first, you've got to know God's for you and that you're the righteousness of God in Christ and you're seated with him in heavenly places. These things have got to be settled in your heart. That's what we're doing here at Karis, is that we're wanting to change your whole image of God. The clock just lost two minutes. Is that? <laughs> the thief cometh to steal. <laughs> I'm not quite done. All right. I swear it was like three minutes and now it's 30 seconds. I don't know what happened. All right. Let's finish up with this. Mark 11, 23. Mark 11, 23 and 24. 
It says in Mark eleven twenty two. <laughs> It says in, in all of our traditional translations, have faith in God. But that just doesn't satisfy me. So I went back and I looked and I looked at all the different translations and I found the Young's Literal. The Young's Literal says, have the faith of God. In the Greek it says, have faith God. You've got to fill in the blanks. Have faith God. So the Young's Analytical says, have the faith of God. And I'm thinking, okay, that's it. But then I read the, the BBE is the Bible in basic English, which I don't read. But in this verse, it just jumped off the page. It says, have God's faith. And I thought, that's it. Because what it goes on to describe isn't human faith. It's God's faith. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says shall happen, he shall have whatever he says. That's the faith of God. That's, that's God calling things that are not as though they are. That's the faith of God. You won't be able to, to move in that realm unless you have the right perception of God and the right perception that you're the righteousness of God in Christ. Then when you, those two things line up, you can have the faith of God. Amen. You're not a victim. Amen. And the devil wants to keep you thinking you're a victim. And he wants to keep you thinking God is way off there and doesn't care. But no, that's what we're here for. We're here to, to have our minds renewed, to have our hearts transformed. We're here to see this so that we can walk in the faith of God. I don't even have to work up faith. I just need to walk with the one that is the author of faith. I walk and talk with God. Praise God. And we begin to speak to things. Now, some things you may you have to, to grow in, 30, 60, 100 fold. That's how the kingdom works. But start growing now. Start taking authority over your life, over circumstances. Don't let circumstances be your Lord. Don't bow the knee to circumstances. When they say you're going to die, you don't have to die. That's the best they know, but I know someone that knows more. Right? When they say you're going to lose everything, you don't have to lose everything. The world has its concepts, but you have God concepts. Amen. We, we serve a good God that surely is blessing us, surely is multiplying us, surely is giving to us exceedingly, abundantly, more than we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. And I'm telling you, that's not going to happen unless you have the right impression of God, the right vision of God, the right vision of who you are in him. And then the circumstances are a piece of cake. Amen. Why? Because the greater one lives in you. And your faith will overcome. Stand up with me, please. Praise God. Father, we love you. And on behalf of everyone in this room, all of us, I'm going to declare on behalf of everyone, we want a bigger vision of you. We want to see you as much as we possibly can for who you are, how great you are, how loving you are, how committed you are to us. Oh, Father, and from that we want to see ourselves as you see us. You rejoice over us with singing. You love us with an everlasting love. You have drawn us with an everlasting love. We want to see ourselves as the righteousness of God in Christ, that you love us as much as you love Jesus. And then, Father, when we get turned loose on the world, look out. We are dangerous. We have the name of Jesus. We have the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the gifts of the Spirit. We have the blood of Jesus. We have the better covenant. We have the promises of God. We have the armor of God, his authority. We have his faith. We have the keys of his kingdom. We are well equipped to win in this life. And I pray for everyone in this room right now, that our, our vision of God would expand, would grow, and never stop growing, and that we would see ourselves as he sees us, and then we can walk in this world and reign in life. Praise God. Father, we thank you. We love you. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.